Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Regional Transportation Committee of the Denver Regional Council of Governments for Tuesday, January 17th. Uh, my name is Kevin Flynn. I'm chairing the meeting. We have a quorum. Not Cam. Thank you. So I call the meeting to order. Uh, the first item of business after that is for public comment. Uh, since we are on virtual, uh, if there is someone in the Zoom meeting who wants to offer public comment, please raise your virtual hand. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, next item is the meeting summary from November. Are there any comments on it? If not, we will accept those and move on to our first action item, uh, fiscal year 2022, first year TIP project delays. And uh, Todd Cottrell, you're going to run this presentation. I am, thank you, Mr. Chair. Everyone hear me? Here yes. Uh, so before you in the attachment is staff's report for the federal fiscal year 22 first year project delays. Uh, the adopted TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases. In each year, a project uh, has assigned Dr. Cog funding including how to address these delays if and when they do happen. So after the end of federal fiscal year 22 in October, uh, Dr. Cog worked with and then also requested CDOT and RTD to review the status of those projects that did have FY22 funding. So for those projects that, that did not initiate their funding um, and did not initiate their assigned project phase with the assigned funding by October, uh, staff worked and contacted those sponsors to find out three essential things. Uh, find out the reason for their delay, um, discover the current status of the project, and also to assist them to uh, develop an action plan so that, that this project phase can go forward. So the attached report summarize, summarizes those fundings. Um, overall, there's 22 projects that are first year delayed. Um, three of those have already been initiated and are no longer delayed and one project sponsor has canceled their project and returned that funding back to Dr. Cog for reprogramming. So a motion this morning um, to approve staff recommendation would allow those 18 currently delayed project, projects to continue. Um, before concluding, I just wanted to point out a few observations from this year's report. Um, so the number of delays, delays this year is back to a relative normal amount, um, at least compared to the last few years as we were dealing with um, the project sponsors impacts to COVID. Um, and so really looking at the details in terms of why um, these projects were delayed, seems to be a fairly equal distribution of right-of-way issues and design issues. Um, and then another main reason stems from what we would like to call a lack of pre-planning, um, pre-planning activities when these projects were first developed. Um, so really staff is kind of working through this proje uh, process in a couple different ways. Um, first, within the, the four rounds of TIP calls for projects, we have added a section within our application that will hopefully address this issue going into the future. Um, we have also begun the process to proactively reach out to each TIP pro project sponsor to begin working with them on a monthly basis to find out what their current status is. And this is regardless if that project is delayed or not. So hopefully these two measures will really improve delays going into the future. Uh, so at this time, be happy to take any comments or questions on this report. Um, just to let you know that the Transportation Advisory Committee did recommend approval. Um, and the motion before you is to recommend to the Dr. Cog Board the actions proposed by Dr. Cog staff regarding TIP project delays for fiscal year 2022. Thank you, Todd. Uh, before uh, asking for questions or discussion, I failed to uh, recognize that RTD, we have a new uh, member uh, on, the RT, on the RTC from Dr. Cog, it's uh, Director Broom. Uh, welcome back. I, I, wa I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions, uh, discussion? Seeing none. Wow. Thank you, Todd. Much appreciated. Uh, next up, yeah, we do need a oh. <laughs> can you tell I'm anxious to get out? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let me solicit a motion from a member. 
to whether or not to recommend approving this. Director Conklin. Thank you, and I believe uh, Commissioner Stewart, you raised your hand for a second. I'll do a second, thank you. Thank you so much. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed, say no. No abstentions, any abstentions say abstain. Hearing none, thank you, Todd. Uh, now this will go to the board. Uh, item five, um, Transportation Advisory Committee guidelines, uh, Jacob Rieger. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the, this item and the next item uh, refer to committee guidelines for both our Transportation Advisory Committee and for this committee, our Regional Transportation Committee. We started a conversation with you all and with TAC back in November um, about making some updates and proposed revisions to each committee's um, committee guidelines. So we're gonna start with TAC. Uh, we've had two, two rounds of discussion with TAC about their committee guidelines. Um, they did recommend to you um, approval of their committee guidelines. So I'm not gonna go through all of the gory details, but I do wanna give you the highlights of the major uh, sort of proposed updates and revisions that we are, um, um, the TAC is now recommending uh, that we're proposing for their guidelines. And then in the next item, we'll talk about RTC committee guidelines. So I thought actually I'd start here. This is in your packet. This is our agenda memo, uh, which I think outlines, there's a lot of sort of digital red ink um, as, as you know, happens when you update committee guidelines after several years. Um, so I thought this might be a better way to kind of organize sort of the thematic um, conversation around um, some of the major updates. We can certainly get into the language itself if we want to do that. We want to be transparent about what we're proposing. But I want to start thematically uh, with some of the major concepts that we're talking about for TAC. Um, so first of all, as background for TAC, remember that there are local government members uh, for TAC from across our region. Um, that are currently appointed directly by our Dr. Cog board chair. And then we have what we call special interest seats. There are currently seven of those on TAC. Those are recommended for approval by our board chair, um, but you all actually take the action to recommend um, anytime there's a vacancy or a change in one of those special interest seats. So with that background, thematically a few things here for TAC. Um, first, we're proposing, and I guess now TAC is proposing um, that they recommended approval of these to expand the local government membership in the large urban counties. Currently, there are two members uh, for each county. And when I say county, I mean geographically, not county government. Um, currently, there are two members uh, for most of the counties. Uh, we're proposing to increase that to three uh, for most of our major urban counties. So that's one big change. Would increase the size of the committee just a little bit. Um, secondly, the role of the sub-regional county transportation forums Currently, when there's a local government vacancy on TAC, and actually for the past several years, ever since we've had the forums, I will go to the forums, I will ask them to recommend a consensus candidate that we will then bring to the Dr. Cog board chair uh, for the chair's approval of, of making, that, making that change, whether you know, a vacancy and a local government member. So here we're actually proposing to kind of formalize that a little bit of that practice and actually have the forums directly approve the members for each county and the alternates. Um, so that is a change. Um, and then we're also um, on the special interest seats. Well, actually, let me back up on that, just to be clear. Currently, when a member is appointed for TAC, a local government member, the member directly appoints their own alternate. So one of the parallel changes here uh, with the forums being recommended to approve directly the TAC members, the forums would also approve the alternates. So basically, each sub-regional transportation forum per county would have a slate of sort of members and alternates approved by the forum. And then on the special interest seats, we had a conversation with TAC about potentially expanding and, and maybe changing just a little bit um, the seven special interest seats. These are folks that are um, sort of allied to transportation, um, you know, non-RTD transit, freight, environment, aviation, you know, disciplines and multimodal transportation planning that uh, really help our work in this region. Uh, so these are subject matter experts representing each of those disciplines. Uh, we are proposing with TAC to slightly expand the number of seven special interest seats. Currently there are seven. Technically proposing to go up to 10, although one of the members, which is non-RTD transit, 
in conversation with um, with TAC, we're actually recommending that that seat be a standing seat, that that would be via mobility, because via mobility is by far um, the greatest provider of transit besides RTD in this region. So this proposal would say that VIA would have a standing seat on RTD, um, and then we would add two special interest seats. One would be that currently we have a seat that's shared um, between transportation demand management and non-motorized because they're um, they're very closely linked together. Um, but we would propose to actually separate those and that each of those is worthy of their own special interest seat. And then we would add a special interest seat related to um, housing interests. And this comes from a previous conversation, in fact, that we've had with you all um, and with our board regarding some of the language in the bipartisan infrastructure law around the linkages and the integration between housing and transportation. So we thought representing housing interests would be important. And then finally, we're proposing to add an equity seat as a special interest seat. We've purposely kept both of those a little bit kind of open-ended to give us some flexibility in terms of who we'd, um, who we'd recommend for approval. But we think both of those topics, both of those subjects, um, are important for uh, special interest seats. Um, and then let's see, finally, um, regarding the special interest seats, we would formally establish a two-year term for those right now. Um, I sort of go to them each year and ask if they are interested in continuing to serve. Sometimes that generates some changes or some vacancies. So we would kind of formalize that those would be two-year terms for special interest seats. Um, we also added a provision. We actually had this situation occur. Uh, where we lost our chair due to a change in employment of TAC. So we had to do an off-year election. Terms in TAC are for every two years. So we actually added a clause to kind of deal with kind of off-cycle elections as needed of officers. And then finally, when you make all of those changes, we're proposing to add about 10, I believe it's 10 additional seats to TAC. So that changes the quorum, uh, which is currently, I believe, 15. Uh, the new quorum for voting at TAC and for passing a motion affirmatively would be 20 um, TAC members. So that's kind of thematically what we're talking about. Um, if we have questions or want to get into the markup, I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, but let me just kind of pause there with that overview and see if there's questions. Thank you, Jacob. Questions? Uh, Dr. Conklin. Mm, there we go. Uh, and I apologize if this is, is you know, uh, getting into too much detail, but the, the, the change in voting members and a quorum and the requirement of 20 affirmative votes required to carry an action. With the additional special interest seats, does that create the opportunity for a special interest to basically block action by the group, you know, adding, adding those positions? Does that question make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense. So let me see if I can answer that appropriately. I think I get what you're saying. The 10 additional members in the change in quorum that you're referring to is primarily driven by the increase in local government members going from two to three for most counties. So yes, there is a little bit of an increase in special interest seats, but I think proportionally, based on the proportion of special interest seat votes, so to speak, compared to the entire committee, that proportion would not change. And I don't think that situation would occur if I understood your question correctly. Did that answer it? Thank you. CEO Johnson. Yes, thank you very much. Good morning, all. I had a question as it relates to clarifying equity, because I know everybody's using that term. And so as we talk about transportation and housing, what is the nexus between the two, and how do you discern the appropriate individual to bridge that gap as we talk about the need to, you know, have representation for um, historically marginalized populations? Yeah, thank you for that question. So as you can see on the screen here, so now we're looking at the markup. We refer to the equity seat as equity populations, marginalized communities. So that gives us, I think, some guidance and some direction, but ultimately that conversation around what does that mean and who would that person be would actually be a conversation that we'd have at this table um, because as per current practice that would continue, RTC would end up actually approving that special interest seat and all the special interest seats. So we would actually have that conversation with you. Uh, Director Papsdorf. Yeah, thank you. And just to expand a little bit, our, for the special interest seats, our practice has been to, and we will continue to solicit interest. So when we have openings for special interest seats, we actually advertise and recruit and take applications through an application process. So it's not, it's not just staff kind of handpicking who we think that should be and bringing that forward to the RTC chair and ultimately to RTC. We actually solicit for interest um, and application for those special interest seats. Thank you. Uh, I could uh, ask you, Ron, to expand a little bit on that. Um, 
if I understood uh, CEO Johnson's question, how, what are the criteria that we will use when we solicit and we get uh, folks who are interested? How do we determine <clears throat> that they can properly uh, represent the interests of marginalized communities? How, how does that work? Mr. Chair, I don't know. <clears throat> Uh, we have not developed specific guidelines. I think we've intentionally been a little um, soft with it because we don't want to sort of lock you or the RTC into sort of a, a strict definition of that. Um, we have been doing a lot of work as an agency. We've got some federal guidance through Title VI and, and some of our environmental justice guidance that will help us think about sort of how we address those issues. We're, we've got new guidance in state law about um, uh, disproportionately impacted communities that will help guide us in terms of identifying those communities that, that should be represented um, in our transportation decision making. Um, but I think we've been, we've been reluctant to, to, to spell out a very specific set of criteria. I would say, Mr. Chair and everyone, in our current practice, whenever we do have a vacancy or need to fill one of our seven special interest seats, and we do that competitive application, Ron referred to, regardless of this, the, the specific seat, uh, whether it's freight or any of the other seats, we do ask applicants for their background and to demonstrate their experience and their knowledge. And um, so we want to make sure that the candidates for any of these special interest seats you know, are subject matter experts in that field, because that's really what we need to help the conversations at TAC. And I think that would be true going forward. Thank you, Jacob. Other questions, comments? Seeing none, this time I will ask for a motion before we move on. Anybody care to make a motion here? Dr. Shaw. Really? Yes, you may. Thank you. Um, I move to recommend the Board of Directors, uh, to the Board of Directors, the updates to the tax section of the Dr. Policy Guides and Descriptions. Thank you. I'll rush to second. Are you willing to second that? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Silverstein. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion, uh, Director Rex? Thank you, sir, very much. I just wanted to give the committee um, an update on as far as process and what happens next if if this is recommended today. So we're in the process. So we have we have a document. Like, knows we have enough documents at Dr. Cog. We have a document for a committee guideline, so all of our committee, and we, we update that document every five years or so, so we take an opportunity to look at all of our committee bylaws every, every five years or so to see if any improvements are needed. So we're, we're, we're aggregating all those committee recommendations right now, like our um, uh, TAC and RTC. We will anticipate that our Area Agency on Aging um, Regional Committee will also have some recommendations for improvement, and those will be taken as a package to the board, we expect, in March. So no changes to RTC will occur until, until at least the March meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, uh, call the question. All those in favor of this motion, please say aye. Any opposed say no. Any abstentions? Thank you. That passes. Next, uh, Regional Transportation Committee guidelines. Our own guidelines. Uh, Jacob, go ahead. Thank you, sir. So, yes, we also started this conversation with you in November about your committee guidelines. Yours, I don't know if they were simpler, but they were at least sort of visually shorter. Um, what we talked about in November and is summarized up on the screen here was really just a couple components for your committee guidelines. Obviously, first of all, as background for you, as you know, you are, in a sense, the MPO committee. Um, you are the MPO advisory committee. You bring together uh, what's required of us under federal law, that 3C planning process, continuous, cooperative, and comprehensive, I think. I hope Ron's not quizzing me, but I think that's right. And really what that means is that we bring together Dr. Cog, CDOT, RTD together, and other stakeholders like RAC <coughs> in our transportation planning process. And this committee is the embodiment of that. So this committee obviously is anchored around the three agencies and some other members. So at your November meeting, one of the topics of conversation was um, those other members of RTC and kind of how we characterize those. That I will show you in the markup in just a moment, but that was a thematic thing that we talked about in November. Um, we also did some clarification around the chair and vice chair of um, RTC, just sort of clarifying that, that relationship and um, uh, as well as when members are appointed, sort of the administrative process for appointing members each year. 
Uh, we talked in November about clarifying the use of alternates, and then we made some other, just as with TAC, some routine updates and clarifications to, um, to your guidelines as well. So I actually want to show you your guidelines. Um, there are not a lot of significant changes since the November meeting, but I do want to highlight um, kind of what we did work on based on the conversation we had with you in November. Probably the biggest one is what you see up on the screen around those other members of RTC. You all had some, um, some good conversation about that in the November meeting. So what we've done based on that input and guidance from you back in November is we've clarified in the paragraph that you see up on the screen, sort of struck a middle ground. We're not actually proposing specific sort of people as maybe we are, um, or even topics as we did with TAC with their special interest seats. But we did clarify, and this is the big change in this paragraph, clarifying some of those thematic subject matter areas of expertise that we would draw from from those other members. And this was based on um, the guidance you gave us around, again, just like TAC, what are those sort of allied or um, related subjects that are important um, to RTC's work and to our multimodal transportation planning work in this region. Um, so that's probably the biggest change since November. Um, this section down here in appointments, this was, we had proposed this change in November in terms of carving out a specific section around the appointment of RTC members, just to clarify that. We had the language in here, but it was a little bit buried. So we've, we've drawn it out into its own section. Here we've just kind of clarified when that would occur. Uh, we're proposing February for the agencies, the, the key agencies, just to have kind of a routinized, you know, we know each year when members will be appointed. And then for the other members, um, to specify that that will also occur annually um, as part of RTC's work. And then down here, this is a little bit more administrative language, but again, just clarifying the use of alternates, um, which you all had talked about in November, um, specifying RAC as, as one of those standing members of RTC. And then this uh, language down here in responsibilities, I think is largely unchanged from November, but again, it's just sort of clarifying, cleaning up just a little bit language um, around RTC's main responsibilities relating to our transportation planning framework document, uh, which you will hear in the next agenda item. And then finally, a change we made since November is around quorum. We haven't changed the quorum, it's 12 members, but we did want to clarify getting Director, Director Conklin to your question about TAC, knowing that this committee has a mix of agency representative and other members. Here, we did want to be a little bit more intentional because um, the quorum is smaller, uh, being clear about including at least two to each from among the Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD members or alternates. Um, again, all of the members are important, but given the 3C planning process, given the importance of the anchor agencies, we wanted to clarify that as part of the quorum. Um, so let's see, I, yeah, I think those are the major changes from, from November. So I think I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Stewart. Thank you, am I, am I on, yeah. Um, Jacob, under other members should be appointed annually by the committee chair upon unanimous recommendation of the executive directors of Dr. Cog and CDOT and the general manager of RTD. In the case of the Transportation Commission, the executive director of, the, of CDOT does not make these appointments. The TC chair makes the appointments. That need to be changed? No, oh, you're going to tell me, Ron? <laughs> Here. Um Director Stewart, actually, that, that language only applies to the other members. It does not apply ah. to the agency members. So Got it. the commission, whatever the CDOT practice is for the commission appointing its members and alternates to RTC, this language only applies to the other members, those three additional seats that serve on RTC. And there's no change in the process here. Okay. Where this, it moved, but we didn't change the language. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you to staff for your work on this and great discussion last month. And uh, it's great to have Regional Air Quality Commission as a standing member. And uh, seeing no other discussion, let me solicit a motion. CEO Johnson. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Who, who said that? Oh. You were hiding, <laughs> uh, Director uh, Busick. Seeing no other discussion, call for the vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Say no. Any abstentions? Hearing none, we are done with that item, and thank you. It's great to have a uh, more predictable and reliable uh, set of guidelines. 
Uh, item seven, transportation planning framework, Matt Helfand. Good morning, Matthew Helfand, senior transportation planner. So um, the framework document used to be called the perspective. I could, uh, it, yeah, the microphone. The, the framework document used to be called the prospectus. It's a roadmap for how trans regional transportation planning in the Denver region is conducted. So the purpose, uh, it describes policies and procedures, details how Dr. Cog, RTD, and CDOT cooperate, and identifies key regional transportation planning products. So the elements are the chapters. They are policy direction, Dr. Cog committees and public and stakeholder engagement, planning process products, and coordination with other transportation processes. So some highlights of the uh, updates uh, since the last update, um, it includes the Colorado Greenhouse Gas Planning Standard as well as the new Surface Transportation Authorization. And uh, you just spoke with Jacob uh, about committee guideline updates and um, this, this document is consistent with those. And the next step in the process is a memorandum of agreement between Dr. Cog, RTD, and CDOT. It's federally required, and the framework and the and the an MOA will um, reference the framework document. And here is your proposed motion, and I'd be happy to take any questions. That had to be the most rapid presentation I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you so much. Any questions, comments? members. E.D. Rex. Mr. Chairman, thank you, sir, very much. And I, I just wanted to re-emphasize the importance of this document. When I came in 2013, um, this was my fourth council of governments that I've, I've been part of, and we never had such document. And it was so unbelievably helpful to me as a new person coming in as the director of transportation and knowing the process that, that we have in place in this region. Um, it, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful document to have. It's a tough, tedious read. I ain't going to lie. But it, it was not meant to read cover to cover. But there, you know, in the event you ever have questions about the process that we utilize here in this region, it's in there. So I want to thank staff for the, for the current updates and our continued partnership with both RTD, CDOT, and, um, and others on, on the board, of course, Regional Air Quality Council. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. The document apparently is in inverse proportion to the presentation. <laughs> right. Excellent. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, I would uh, solicit a motion from anyone so willing to do it. People are reluctant to make motions today. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors approval of the Transportation Planning Framework doc document. And we have a second from second. CEO Johnson. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Say no. Any abstentions? Seeing none, uh, we move on. That is approved. Informational briefings, 2021 annual report on traffic congestion. Mr. Spots. Good morning. Um, I'm Robert Spots. I manage the mobility analytics program here at Dr. Cog, and I'm going to talk about our 2021 annual report on traffic <coughs> congestion. Uh, it's 2023 now, but we're finally here talking about 2021. Uh, been some crowded agendas um, and a busy year at Dr. Cog. So. Um, this is part of our federally required congestion management process. You all have a copy of the report on the desk. We have a few more if you'd like to take some extras home. But today we're going to talk about what happened in 2021. Obviously, a, a, another really interesting year coming out of the pandemic. Again, looking at 2050 uh, congestion projections, projections, and then how um, some congestion mitigation approaches kind of mesh with our new planning process with the greenhouse gas process and and um, kind of alternate ways of, of thinking about congestion manage, mitigation. Starting with those observations, in uh, 2021, um, VMT certainly rebounded a little bit compared to uh, 2020 during the heart of the COVID uh, pandemic. But going back in time a little bit, you know, from, 
from 20, 2000 to 2006, we had, and, and before that, we had really stable VMT growth in this region and nationally. Starting around 2006, a year before the Great Recession, VMT really tapered off and leveled out for um, several years, kind of through the Great Recession. There was not very much VMT growth and a, kind of a, a relatively big rebound. I'm kind of back to that, to on track to where we were before. However, in 2018 and 19, we didn't really see much VMT growth there either. Um, and then obviously in 2020, the big dip from the pandemic. And now we're saying, we're estimating that in 2021, we were about 3% less um, than 2019. But that doesn't tell the whole story because through this entire time period, despite what VMT was doing, our population was growing at a pretty rapid pace. Um, so you can see VMT per capita went down significantly through the Great Recession. And then um, in 2018-19, it started to dip there as well because even though as VMT kind of leveled out, our population was still growing. Obviously decreased significantly during the pandemic um, and rebounded above our MetroVision target back in, in 2021, but has not um, kind of reached the, the heights that um, obviously we were, we were pre-pandemic, a long way away from that. So VMT per capita significantly down in 2021. Um, a little unclear what will happen in 2022 with a lot of unknowns and um, new trends, new observations we're, we're experiencing. We'll kind of get into some of those trends uh, through this report. So th this is um, looking at some very specific uh, traffic or tra traffic recorder stations. So kind of they, they count traffic 24 hours a day, 365. Um, and 2019 is the baseline there in gray. So this is the change in volume at these specific stations. We'll get into a few of these. But this is kind of a relatively average one um, throughout the region where you see, you know, coming in through out in January, you know, most people were still not vaccinated then. Vac vaccinations were really limited in who, who was getting those. And then towards the middle of the year, as vac vaccinations became more widely available to the population, um, we kind of found a new form of normalcy or a return to normalcy. By um, September, even, uh, vehicle miles traveled at this station were actually even above what was going on in 2019. And then uh, moving into December, that's when the Omicron variant really popped its head up and a lot of decrease in travel over there. Again, new mask requirements um, and, and kind of a retreat back away from normal behavior. Um, so then, but not all stations are the same. And this is just, this, you know, the, I th I'd say in general, the pandemic caused us to look at data in a new way where we haven't really looked at it before. Um, so when we talk about regional things in specifically, you know, that we talk about regional metrics, but there's a lot of really local things happening and different ways of travel throughout the region and roads are being used for different things. Uh, so 104th in Quebec, um, you know, never, never decreased as much as uh, C-470, kind of stayed about the same, um, but followed a similar trend overall. U.S. 36 in McCaslin really had a big dip. Um, at, at, in January and, and during throughout the pandemic and still has never returned to 2019 levels throughout the entire 2021 year. We believe that's because this corridor is really used as kind of an office commuting corridor where a lot of people from, you know, Denver through Boulder and Louisville are, there's a lot of kind of office commuters and those types of trips have really not returned, at least not through 2021. And then finally, um, one at I-270 at York in Commerce City, where there's a lot more commercial traffic, freight traffic. And so, you know, that type of activity didn't decrease nearly as much. And so we didn't see those dips on I-270 that we saw on other corridors because that type of activity kept on going through the pandemic regardless. Uh, now we're going to look at differences by time of day. Um, so this is looking uh, from, you know, 12 to a.m. to, to um, over 24-hour period. And, you, and if you look at just the orange one in April 2019, that, that line is what we kind of historically expect, that there's a big a.m. peak where on, on a roadway you, you get a bunch of traffic in the a.m. and p.m. peaks, right? In 2020, obviously, it wasn't anything like that. They call that a camel sometimes. And now that, that blue line in April 2020 was more like a, a whale or something like that. It's... <laughs> I think somebody else said that. I'm just, I'm just ripping off their yeah, line. Uh, but, but, you know, obviously decreased traffic, and you can see a really flattening of those peaks um, where kind of tra travel increased and kind of stayed the same throughout the whole day. 
Um, by April of 2021, you know, the PM peak had basically returned to pre-pandemic conditions. However, the AM peak really lagged behind, and there was just a lot less traffic in the AM. Um, moving forward to October, same graph. Uh, you know, by you can see in October of 2020, that blue line, that whale really grew and almost became a camel again. But uh, in October of 2021, again, PM peak, basically to pre-pandemic conditions, but that AM peak still kind of lagged behind. And I think, you know, we don't have full data for 2022 yet, but we're still, and may, maybe you all experienced this this morning, that the AM peak has not seemed to return to pre-pandemic conditions, um, anecdotally at least. But we'll see what the data tells us about 2022. Looking at some other modes um, and how, how that went through the pandemic in 2021, you know, as we've seen, that blue line is um, traffic volumes, kind of generically. Uh, the 2019, compared to a 2019 baseline, uh, you know, traffic almost back to uh, that 2019 baseline by the end of 2021. As we know, transit ridership did not have that same recovery. Um, so, you know, lots of work to do. RTD is going through a process now, evaluating how, how to, you know, reimagine themselves coming out of this and the new way of people traveling um, in this post-pandemic world. This one's always an interesting one. We have really good data at Pena Boulevard um, because of their traffic counters there, um, as well as their, um, their passenger data. And you can just see it's, it's pretty interesting, just the relationship between volume on Pena Boulevard um, especially east of E470 on Pena Boulevard compared to passengers. Um, obviously, a really big dip, especially in passengers in 2020. Um, but, you know, that's kind of returning uh, to, to normal as we get back to 2021. Um, not quite to 2019 levels, but uh, obviously a recovering industry and uh, significant traffic on that roadway. Um, now we're going to talk about micromobility trips in the Denver region. This is really exciting data we have. We have it through a partnership um, with the cities uh, around the region, as well as the, the providers of this data. Um, it's a pretty unique data set to have. We were awarded uh, an award by the Association of um, MPOs because of this partnership and this very cool data set we were able to um, acquire. But looking back at 2019, um, you can see some seasonality of this data. This is the total number of riders by month in 2019. And then we go to 2020, and you see generally, despite the fact that there was a pandemic, this was a growing, um, a growing type of trip making because of the, the additional providers, the additional vehicles out on the road. And so even in May of 2020, you know, basically during the absolute heart of the pandemic, we had more riders kind of using these shared vehicles that people were touching and sharing with each other because it was such a, it was an outdoor thing and, and a growing um, type of uh, mode. And then you can see really big growth in 2021 as these vehicles became even more widely available, um, even more options for people to find these vehicles and use them and hopefully um, replace single occupancy vehicle trips or connect to other modes, non-SOV modes. Up there, and we'll move on to talking about 2050. You know, I think 2050 has become an interesting um, projection for us because Things have changed in the way we think about the future and our predictions. We've adjusted telework rates in our model um, as a result of the pandemic, um, which, which affects all things. We've now looked, looking at 2050 through the lens of the greenhouse gas rule. And what, is, what does um, congestion mean when we're thinking about 2050 now in the context of those two things? We're still anticipating you know, another million people here between 2020 and 2050, so not as much growth in the, as of the previous 30 years but still a significant amount of new people. And um, we expect, you know, not too many new roadways that that's going to result in significant increases in congestion. Uh, so we anticipate that congestion at 2, two o'clock in 2050 will be about as bad as the PM uh, rush hour is today. Um, inside the, your report, there's this map which shows uh, what Dr. Cog considers the most severely congested corridors in the region. The red ones are what we consider severely congested in 2021. The orange is the additional roadways we anticipate being congested by 2050. So you know, we're expecting serious increases in the magnitude and the, the duration um, and the scale of congestion in this, in this region. Um, and it's going to require some really creative thinking um, to mitigate that. Um, so we're going to talk about approaches. Um, there's, there's a list of kind of 
projects that have are underway or um, just completed uh, that we do anticipate will have an, an impact on congestion. But I, I think you know the greenhouse gas rulemaking um, when you're tackling this really big pro problem of how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions really informed us that there is no silver bullet to to reduce greenhouse gases the same way with congestion. It's just going to take creative thinking, you know, innovative um, innovative projects and just, a, you know, a, a wide range of projects. There's no single project it's going to take, you know, we're going to chip away at this thing um, with all of our all of our projects and um, everything we can, can do. So just to highlight a few of those and the, the way we're thinking about these is this is a really cool project that, that just opened. Um, it's an, a dual underpass. So before uh, before you to on a bike path, the Highline Canal, going from the city of Denver into Cherry Hills Village there, you actually needed to cross on that yellow line. You needed to cross Hamden and cross Colorado uh, to, to get across here. This project created two underpasses uh, for bike heads. They go under Colorado and under Hamden. Um, and, you know, the, aside from, obviously, the safety implications of that for bikes, bicycle, and pedestrian trips, it reduces conflicts between th those modes so that, you know, the, the vehicles don't have to stop for pedestrians and bikes. They don't have to watch out for them as, as well. They should actually watch out for them. Those. <laughs> but they, uh, <laughs> they, um, and then, you know, the people, the people that are using um, this facility are not on the road, so they're not experiencing that congestion themselves. And they're reducing vehicles on the roadway that reduces congestion on the roadway. Another one to highlight um, is this uh, coordination project between Denver, Lakewood, and CDOT uh, along a long corridor, that go, the corridors that go through there. And so this helps with signal timing, which increases the flow of traffic, reduces emissions by doing that, um, gets people where they're going um, more efficiently, and also helps with incident management, where if there's a crash, you know, that they can coordinate and help, help travelers figure out alternate routes or warn them that this is coming, potentially so that they delay their trip until the incident is cleared out. And this is the type of project you're going to hear about um, as a funding opportunity as when Greg discusses the RTOT um, call for projects coming up right after my presentation here. And we'll highlight busting as well. These, you know, the busting is an opportunity for people that used to make really long drives, whether on a daily basis or occasionally to completely remove themselves from congestion and avoid it and get other things done on the bus and also take some vehicles off the road, which in, in increases uh, vehicle flow. So, you know, again, these, no one of these projects, obviously, is going to solve our, our region's congestion problems. But if we, if we chip away at this thing together and think about this in creative ways and with all of the great projects you all are working on, we can make a significant impact on, on reducing congestion in this region. So, there's certainly going to be growth in congestion. We, we absolutely expect that, especially with the growth in population in this region. Um, but there, the, the fact remains that people still need to travel to get to the, the things they need to do. Some people absolutely need to drive to their workplace. There's no, not any other option to school, to healthcare. There's going to be continued need to drive. Um, and then if you're not driving, you're probably getting your goods delivered. <laughs> if you're eating food in this region, it came in on a truck or was grown here and bust in, you know, we have to think about the, the way the delivery of goods and services is happening in this region. So yes, again, mitigation is going to require effective planning and partnerships that all, all the great work you all around this table are doing to contribute. Um, and I kind of touched this, but yeah, the, the, the new 2050 RTP invests even more projects that, that reduce emissions, but we believe also help people avoid and adapt to congestion. And the modeling kind of demonstrates that, that the greenhouse gas 2050 RTP has um, less congestion in it than, than before. So um, just to highlight a lot of the great work that's happening around Dr. Cog to reduce congestion. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. Sorry, I was talking to Cam. Uh, questions? White. I actually don't have a question, just a compliment. This is one of my favorite reports of the year. I'm so glad you all produce it. I um, would hope maybe CDOT would do something for the state at one point because it's just really helpful to think about what's going on. So thank you.
Director Shaw. Thank you. And mine's just an observation that um, I had no idea how well people could get from remote places into Denver or other places through busting. It it surprised me. I had not seen a map like that. So um, very helpful. And really, this overview is very helpful to show um, that <laughs> people were out driving around during the pandemic, and we kind of knew it, but this proves it. Thank you. I have a, uh, Matthew, thank you for this. I have a couple of clarifying questions. Well, actually one that's got several components to it. On the slide about the 2050 population growth and congestion, uh, the current population of 3.36 million growing to 4.41 million as a projection. Curious where did we get those figures? Is that just the Dr. Cog area? Is that Denver, Boulder, MSA? What area is that uh, 3.36 million? Good question. That is, that is the Dr. Cog area. Okay. The projections in the current data is informed by the state's um, demographer. They gave us our, our county control total, county projections for each county. Okay, thank you. And then to follow on, I'm pleasantly surprised that the 30-year growth, uh, as opposed to the 30-year growth from 1990, is significantly less, projected to be significantly less, uh, not just in whole numbers, but if you look at it as a percentage of the whole from 90 to 20, and then from 20 to 50, it's significant. Uh, and that, again, comes from the state demographer. It does, yeah. Um, I'm I, not the demographer at locally here in Dr. Cog either, so I, I couldn't speak to it exactly, but there's certainly a, a slowing of growth for the next 30 years. Hey, thank you. Uh, Director Papstorff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'll take this opportunity. I think it, it would be a good, um, a good lesson to have a presentation here at RTC around some of our land use forecasts. We, we have a team here that is really excellent at this work, does a tremendous amount of work in this area in terms of land use forecasting, and as you can imagine, has very, very important ramifications for how we as a region address our transportation needs and how we envision the future transportation needs, because it's not just the numbers, it's the demographics of those numbers. It's the aging of the population that has, um, that, that has impacts. It's the change in household types and sizes that has an impact on our transportation needs long term. So I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss maybe when, when would be appropriate to bring back to the committee a presentation from our own um, land economics planners talking a, a little bit more specifically forecast. Thank you. Um, Robert, I apologize for calling you Matthew. Uh, <laughs> I was dealing with three different things here at once. Uh, I don't know if you can explain or offer some um, clarity on the time of day chart and the fact that the evening, the PM peak, thank you, yeah, that's it, and actually go back to the April one, that's even clearer, uh, that the PM peak seems to have recovered, and in this case, uh, for an hour or so, exceeds 2019. That seems to fly in the face of all of the reports we're hearing about folks working from home and office vacancies, especially since this is 2021, and we were kind of still in the depths of you know, what's going to be the new work model or the commute model. Is there any explanation for why uh, the PM peak would, have, would be matching 2019 when everybody I know is still working from home? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really good question. And I'll start by saying that this is kind of, this is just one uh, ATR station. So we saw, right. we saw that there was variation throughout the region. So you could, you know, honestly, you could look at a bunch of these and you would just kind of be like, what is going on at this one? Or, right. <laughs> you know, that because, um, yeah, there is so much difference. We kind of chose this one because it felt like the most representative of kind of this wide range of, of all these ATR stations we have that, that tra record traffic. So, you know, there, there's a possibility that at this, this location, for example, maybe this, this roadway is reaching its basically capacity at, at the PM peak, and it's kind of gotten back to that where it's reaching um, the PM um, peak capacity of the road where it can't really take much more than that 7,000 per hour, just as an example of what may be going on here. Uh, otherwise, there might be something at this facility that just makes it, like, that makes people travel during the PM peak for whatever reason it is. 
and not so much during the AM peak. But generally speaking, it's been a national trend that the AM peak has not returned to its normal um, pre-pandemic conditions. We talked about this on Friday at the staff meeting about, uh, well, perhaps uh, as the day goes on, and especially as people s stop working, even if they're working from home, they head out and do errands that they couldn't have done maybe when they were working in an office. They, so there are more trips. Yeah. Uh, you said they're, the, the per capita VMT is lower, uh, so they're short, obviously shorter trips. Maybe run to the store or pick up the kids from school or something like that. I'm also curious that the AM peak, although it's recovering, seems to have significantly less volume than the PM peak, which implies to me that people are leaving in the evening and not coming back in the morning. So is there an explanation for that? Yeah, I think that the, the second part of your first question relates to that that I was going to say is that, you know, a lot of trips are not commute trips, right? Commute, right. commute trips, especially to an office commute, mm -hmm. are a very relatively small percentage of trips and VMT in this region. You know, you've got I'll just thinking about freight and, and people going to school and healthcare and shopping and all those things. So people commuting to offices is, we think, you know, less than 10%, significantly less than 10%. To begin with. To begin with. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, any other questions? It's really been enlightening. Uh, E.D. Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, Robert, will you go forward a couple slides? Yeah, that one there on the transit ridership one. Um, understanding that these are, this is data from 2021, I just wanted, uh, I know CEO Johnson or maybe Mr. Welsh might want to comment that I know there are some promising signs as it, as it relates to, rider, to ridership um, over the last several months, and I just wanted to know if you wanted to comment on that. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Executive Director Rex, for posing the question. We've seen some uptick, and as we've seen just across the country holistically, um, that there is the great probability that we won't recoup about 20% of transit ridership pre-pandemic. And as we look at the ridership, we've determined that there has been an upswing in off travel peak times, people going to sporting events, different social gatherings and things of the like. So it's indicative of what we saw relative to those vehicle miles traveled. Same aspect in the sense that people aren't using transit traditionally to get to work sites because they're leveraging teleworking, but we're seeing it in other aspects as we're human beings and we like that social interaction and that's clearly what we see going forward. So it'll be interesting to see and I'd be remiss uh, not to state this since I have the floor. It's interesting how we keep looking back at 2019 and we're now in 2020. Three, and as we look at trends for three years, as we go forward, we can now draw a line in the sand and say this is what the norm is going forward and ascertain what we're trying to achieve relative to transit uses just holistically. And uh, Mr. Welch, I don't know if you want to opine on anything further, but please feel free. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, the only thing I would add is that our ridership trends uh, between the bus system and the rail system are not heading in the same direction at the same pace. If you look at our bus system, we're experiencing some very promising signs. Actually, uh, you know, the core, what we would call our core now of the bus system has actually stayed pretty stable even, even after the pandemic. The rail side, though, um, is posing more challenges, particularly light rail. So we, we anticipate that uh, we will be looking at creative strategies on how to approach those two differently because while that trend looks simple, it's, it's much more complex than that. And I think if we recognize we probably accelerated teleworking by maybe 10 years in the last two years, that, that's had a, mo a much more profound impact on part of our system than it has on the other. But we're really excited about where we're headed on, on bus. Thank you. And Mr. Papstorff. I think those are really interesting observations. Uh, one, one way to start thinking about light rail is just because of that past investment in that light rail system, um, that excess capacity in the system might give the region some opportunities to think about sort of development around stationaries around those light rail stations to fill some of that capacity, right? We have, um, we have made major investments in that system <clears throat> despite the fact that the growth rates are anticipated to be lower over the next 30 years, there's still a significant amount of growth that's going to occur in this region. And so what the light rail system does is provide us an opportunity to think about how we can, can accommodate part of that growth to take advantage of that part of the transportation system. Thank you. Any other questions? 
questions. If not, uh, thank you very much, Robert. Appreciate it. Uh, next item is number nine. While we're setting that up, uh, the sign-up sheet came back, and we have a new alternate as well from RTD, a new board member, Michael Guzman. Welcome. Thank you. Our next item is uh, Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Plan, R-T-O-T. -T. It's pronounced RITOT, right? <laughs> Steve? <laughs> no? I actually never called it that. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, yeah, my name is Steve Cook, and I'm kind of the segue between the congestion and the mobility analytics, which you just heard about, and I manage that and now going into the transportation operations, which I also manage, and Greg McKinnon will come up here uh, in a second. And so this document, which is in your pack, and I, I think this is Rebecca's second favorite document. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but, but a very, very, very important document, as, as dry as it might seem, but it really gets into the day-to-day -day operations that are so critical that the public, much of the public really doesn't understand the thousands of people that are working either at the transit agency, at the DOTs, in public works that are out there out tonight snow plowing. They're going to be doing all these people from a regional standpoint and a local standpoint are helping the transportation system operate. And that's one of the things where this document goes into uh, several items and initiatives that uh, Greg will talk about in a minute that are just so important for these day-to-day -day things and then bringing in the technology aspect. One thing we always note that you know, technology in and of itself you know, is not a solution. You know, it's a tool that can help you do some of these different operational improvements, getting information out to travelers, responding to incidents. It's very, very uh, critical. I'll just do one more slide before I turn it to Greg, but the perspective of this is there's 15 million, over 15 million trips made per day, and that's all modes, all types of travel. 13 million of those are in motor vehicles, whether you're driving or, whether, or a passenger. Uh, two, over 2 million, actually, of pedestrian and bicycle trips every day, 10 million vehicle trips, that's what creates the 80 million or 85 million VMT vehicle miles traveled per day that Robert was talking about uh, a minute ago. Uh, a lot of congestion, as was discussed earlier, and probably most critically is the crashes and incidents. And that's, I think, uh, the one element of uh, the operations plan, all the daily operations is getting that response to incidents, you know, dispatching of emergency crews, then getting the traveler information out there, getting the information to, information to all of us so we can decide, well, should we change our route? Should we look at our phone, you know, see what Google or Waze or is saying about this uh, uh, incident? So all these things are really important to the regional transportation operations and technology, or RTOT. Uh, uh, plan and I will let Greg get into more of the technical details and some of the other aspects of the document. No action today. Uh, information today. Action. So, is anyone else now hungry for lunch when you're talking about tots? Uh, um, so, uh, some of these slides you'll recall uh, from May when we were uh, uh, providing a briefing then. Uh, this slide here is showing that we're not starting from scratch. There's a lot of technology out there already. A lot of investments gone into the signalized intersections uh, through Dr. Cog, through the Traffic Signal System Improvement Program uh, uh, for oh, nearly three decades now. Um, and uh, with the, the transit, uh, you can see that the service miles, but the, more importantly on there, there's a lot of information being collected about the transit service with the automated vehicle location and also uh, automated passenger counting, uh, so we know uh, where the vehicles are and, and, and what, uh, what load they have. Uh, that's probably not the right term, but 
we have a lot of uh, traffic cameras that allow the operators to understand what's going on in, uh, on the network. And that's aside from the security cameras, and uh, I'll, it was, was largely on the transit system for uh, uh, things are safe. Um, and we have the uh, the fiber optic network is a robust communications that can interconnect uh, things in, in the field and and potentially even inter interconnecting jurisdictions. And moving on to other uh, um, technologies, where there's uh, nearly 200 intersections that have. Um, uh, bicycle detection to determine when to bring up a special phase during the, uh, the traffic signal cycle. So this is the graphic that we used last time to describe what we have for the strategic plan. We started out with vision and goals, uh, developed a set of objectives, and then uh, in the vernacular of the regional ITS architecture, a, um, a, a federally required document that we have to prepare. Uh, we created an operational concept of basically describing the roles and responsibilities of how we'd like to be able to collaborate uh, as a region, all the different uh, modes and all the different jurisdictions working together. And the goal of the document was to develop a set of regional initiatives uh, that would then uh, inform how do we go about uh, developing our call for projects for the, uh, the, the regional transportation operations and technology set aside which will be coming up here shortly. Um, and uh, right now we've identified about 16 million uh, over that four year period, might even be more, uh, looking at the, the project savings that are coming in. This is uh, the vision statement that hasn't changed since the last time you saw it, just emphasizing that you know interconnected, collaborative, uh, and, and being able to have safe and reliable and efficient operations. So that those are the, the highlights out of the, the vision. The goals uh, directly uh, connect with those items there. The efficient and seamless travel uh, is for all modes uh, and, and being able to connect in, and uh, trip travel time reliability is uh, meeting the, our travelers' expectations, uh, making sure that uh, from day to day they are getting the same experience that they had the day, the day previous. So here's some of the new stuff that uh, uh, you'll see in the document. Of the objectives where we, um, the safety is the, the highest priority, you know, improving safety, reducing crashes, fatalities, and injuries. Uh, we we uh, are emphasize improving transit operation performance. Uh, it's mostly a, uh, a, a reliability aspect to, to that. Uh, improving operator and traveler decision making. I think that was a, a, a comment that came from this group last time, but, but that's basically meeting the sense of uh, well, what we're trying to achieve here is to be able to provide the information uh, to both <laughs> the operators and to travelers so that they can make the best decisions possible uh, to, uh, um, for the travelers to uh, you know, meet their mobility demands and for the operators to provide a safe uh, and efficient and reliable uh, uh, services. Uh, improving the air quality and reducing transportation related emissions is uh, a, an objective we've been carrying forward from the very uh, beginning of the traffic signal system improvement program, and increasing uh, trip time reliability for travelers. The, the, uh, you know, it is a goal, but we also made it an objective. It's something that can be measured, and so we want to be able to track that and report it. The, um, the other thing we want to do is to not be part of the problem. So we want to make sure that the op operating the systems themselves are not causing delay or disruptions to, to our, um, our customers. Part of that is making sure that the infrastructure is reliable and uh, available. Those are um, terms of art. We want to make sure that the system isn't broken. It's well maintained. Uh, we have uh, uh, the next three are the incident management uh, related, reducing uh, incident duration and disruption. The occurrence of secondary incidents that is uh, strong related, strongly related to the one above. The longer the incident exists out in the field, the greater the chance of a secondary incident and extending uh, the, um, the disruption and causing more um, um, personal injury. And then uh, there's a, a new focus on emergency responders struck by that's making sure that our responders are safe in the field and uh, you know, making sure that, our, that the actions that we take 
are, are protecting the people in the field and uh, poor decisions aren't made uh, during a, a uh, response. So here, just a couple graphics and all you can see are color spots as I know, but I think it's, it's still meeting my, uh, my intent. Uh, so in, in the report, we uh, uh, um, took a look at the, the current status of, of what we have in, this, in, in the system and it's, uh, there's a physical component to it and there's what we do with it. And this is showing some of the, the physical inventory. On the, on the left, we have arterial traffic cameras uh, that provide uh, the operators a, a visual of what's actually happening in the field, the greater situational awareness. But you can clearly see that there's you know, dense areas and sparse areas. So you know, there, there is a need for um, filling in some of those areas uh, because there's a lack of situational awareness. The other diagram uh, with the multiple colors is showing our traffic signal systems. Uh, we have signals all over the place, over 4,000 of, of them, uh, but there um, are multiple neighboring systems that are uh, different manufacturer and may or may not be compatible if we're looking to integrate those systems. In the past, this hasn't been an issue uh, because we came up with a set of objectives that where we were able to operate the systems independently and with our assistance here at Dr. Cog, uh, have good signal timing uh, going across jurisdictional boundaries. Um, but now, uh, and it was expressed in the last presentation, there's an opportunity to interconnect the systems and uh, provide uh, greater awareness for the operators. Uh, and that was the example of uh, CDOT, Denver, and Lakewood. Uh, they, there's they have a like system. It's uh, I won't name the, the product name, but they are. It was an easier option to be able to connect those those systems together. It's going to be a greater challenge to connect systems that are foreign to each other. So this diagram, I, I keep coming to it because I think it's it's highlighting the important parts. And when we get into the next few slides, where we talk about the initiatives from in the report. But this is the theme, the, 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 the whole purpose behind, uh, or the core to what the, the plan is, is putting forward. And it's, it's being able to share information and do something with it. Uh, so we have uh, the, the top uh, green box, the situational awareness platform is one of the, the things that's being recommended. And that's pulling together the, the data for all the operators uh, to have a better understanding of what's going on uh, at any given moment. And that information then is available to operations and emergency staff. Uh, it could be the people in the field or the uh, computer-aided uh, dispatch or the dispatch uh, or communication specialists, I think we call them now. Um, and similarly, the performance monitoring data archive platform is using the data, uh, but more from a historical sense and understanding the trends and making sure that, uh, that, that we can make, take some actions that will counteract those trends and improve our reliability and efficiency. And then <clears throat> the, the last one, the multimodal regional travel information platform is, is a key one for our customers, the travelers. Um, right now we have multiple traveler information uh, services provided, but they're all separate. Uh, you know, and what we are talking about is just needing to bring that all together so that the operators have the opportunity to compare uh, their mobility options and change uh, modal decisions. And spill your water underneath, sorry. Um, so those are the key elements uh, coming out of the plan. Whoops, press the wrong button. So the uh, initiatives that, that are listed in there are, are gonna be the, the, the core scoring elements for our uh, call for projects as we're coming up is uh, starting off with the, you know, the highest uh, group we have. We have three groups, primary, secondary, and, and tertiary. Within the groups, we're not really uh, um, finding a priority within the group, but just uh, these are the most important and foundational elements that are going to be built on by the other um, uh, initiative groups. But the situational uh, awareness platform is here. Camera control sharing. So we uh, want to be able to have uh, jurisdictions be able to share their cameras uh, and, and not only be able to see the images like we do now on travel information, but be able to control the camera to look at specific things that are important across the jurisdictional boundaries. And similarly, uh, be able to share that with the, the dispatch for emergency response. 
they can uh, use the cameras and see what's happening at the crash scene and dispatch the correct vehicles the first time instead of um, you know uh, waiting for the first responder to arrive and, and then make an assessment. Um, want to be able to expand the the detection that we have out there to improve our situational awareness. So that's the third bullet, and the performance measures data platform uh, is is the next logical step. Once we have all that data, we need to be able to look at it and um, see uh, what, what the performance trends are to be able to counteract any negative trends. And that is the strategy and processes uh, bullet that I mentioned below. Traffic incident management operating uh, procedures, it's something that's going on now uh, with the uh, led by CDOT and CSP uh, traffic incident management program. Um, what, one of the, the big things that they uh, have highlighted is integrating the uh, computer-aided dispatch with the traffic management centers so that uh, uh, both uh, of the operating centers know, uh, are aware of each other's activities. So the computer-aided dispatch knows where the congestion is and so not to route emergency vehicles that way, for example, and vice versa, the traffic management center will know where crashes are uh, in the system uh, to be able to um, better respond at a, from a regional perspective. And another thing that's going on is our transit signal priority optimization. Um, we have several deployments and it's increasing, uh, you know, uh, I won't say daily, but we're looking to continue to increase that. Um, but the, the coordination of two systems is, is critical to be able to maintain the efficiency and, and, and make it reliable. Uh, right now we have the transit data and the traffic data and to be able to look at those things separately isn't achieving that. So we're looking to bring those together and have a, a better set of, of procedures to keep that optimized. Within the secondary group, uh, there's you know expansion from uh, what, what I just described. Uh, so the, the evacuation planning is kind of out <clears throat> excuse me, outside of that, but comes directly from the wildfires that we had December 2021. Uh, there, there was a lack of awareness on the operator side of, you know, what, um, what uh, evacuation planning that we had. So <clears throat> we want to make sure that that's something that, that will be in place for any future instance. Um, and that it, what would be supporting that, but also in just day-to-day -day activities, is coordinating the travel information messaging between agencies. Um, we we want to make sure that we're having consistent messages that are aligned, rather than um, having competing messages that might uh, confuse the public. Uh, work zone monitoring, coordination, uh, and safety technology applications. You know, these are items to, in the field to not only make the work zones safer. Uh, but will help uh, with the travel information and operation staff to be able to be better aware of what's going on in the region to be able to uh, accommodate those disruptions. Uh, then the, the tertiary group, the regional multimodal travel information platform that I mentioned is the uh, bringing together all of the travel information into one place available for uh, the public to use. And then uh, something that was pointed out in the mobility choice blueprint uh, is the, the multimodal trip planner and payment system that uh, is a tremendous interest of RTD. And um, the continuity of operations, let's skip down to that one, is related to our evacuation planning because that uh, was an experience of one jurisdiction where they lost access to their traffic management center uh, during the wildfire. Uh, the traffic, transportation demand management there is uh, an effort going on at Dr. Cog right now to uh, do a strategic plan for transportation demand management. So don't don't have a lot to say about that, but there is related support. You know, some of the things that have been identified for transportation demand management uses uh, technology and tools that are already available. So we just want to make sure that the connection between the operations and the demand management planning uh, will work together. So that's. A quick run through, you can read through it at your leisure. Uh, like Steve said, we'll be coming back for action uh, at the next meeting. Uh, but my conclusions here, and it's repeating some of the things that, that Steve said, is that you know the real-time data is essential 
uh, for achieving our goals and objectives that, that we've been talking about, not just in this document, but the documents leading uh, to it. We need to be able to collaborate and integrate our operations, um, and not only the physical collaboration and, <clears throat> and, um, and interconnection of things, but be able to come up with procedures to work together uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And like Steve said, uh, we've got to recognize technology is not a tool, or sorry, it is a tool and uh, not the answer. Uh, we, need, we need something to help our staff to be able to uh, provide uh, the services that they're providing. But we also have to recognize the capabilities and needs of, of each jurisdiction and, and, and um, agency uh, vary. So we have to be able to accommodate that to be able to continue the collaboration. Um, part of that is the, you know, that regional management is going to be required for some of these key initiatives. And I, I would highlight those, those platforms. Uh, you know, that that's, can't be shouldered by um, some jurisdictions in, in, in the region. So it's something that we, we need leadership from our, our, um, our um, more regional groups. And that's you know, what we highlight here is Dr. Cog may provide uh, a role in that, being able to assist with the, the monitoring of uh, performance indicators for uh, the traffic signal systems. Um, it's kind of an evolution from what we've been doing now where we provide uh, traffic signal timing support for the, the, uh, the local jurisdictions. Uh, and now that support's gonna evolve, evolve from actually going out in the field, but to just analyzing the data and then making recommendations from that data to provide support. That's my quick, quick run through and conclusions. Uh, Available for any questions. Thank you. Before we go to questions, Mr. Papp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, first of all, I just want to express um, gratitude and thanks to Greg and his team for leading this effort. Um, this is like like most of the regional planning efforts that Dr. Cog undertakes. This is not Dr. Cog. <clears throat> this is us collectively. This is all of the agencies and the partners that operate this very complex system in this region. All aspects of the system really have to work together for us collectively to be able to optimize the performance of the system. And so I would, I would just ask as, as leaders of your organizations and your jurisdictions, as you're thinking about operating your systems and technology investments and other decisions, think about how they fit into this regional system together. It doesn't do any of us any good if one part of the system is operating really, really well, but it's not working in concert with other parts of the system. And that's why this document is so important. That's why we believe it's so important as a region for us to continue to work together. So um, I just want to emphasize the importance of this. It, it can feel, I think, a little, a little dry, a little sort of removed from sort of what we think about from a policy standpoint, but there are really significant policy decisions that our local jurisdictions uh, make, that our agency partners make, that really impact our success um, as a region in terms of operating the system. So uh, again, thanks to Greg, thanks to all of your staff that work with our staff in the operations realm. Uh, they have really important conversations around this region. Thank you, uh, Ron. Thank you, Greg. Questions? Uh, Commissioner Stewart. <laughs> yeah. Comment about how impressive this is. Um, Bob and I, Bob Rim and I were talking, I don't know, a couple of months ago about the old days when we were both on Dr. Cog, uh, not the, uh, the 1990s. And how something like this wasn't possible because technology wasn't that advanced. I didn't have a cell phone in those days. Um, and so to watch this transform how we deal with these challenges, really impressive. And um, out of the document, it's great. Thank you. Director Shaw. Thank you. My question is, um, well, I had gone into the one of the Douglas County Traffic Control Centers a few years ago, and I asked the question, how long do you archive this data? And the answer was, we don't. And my feeling is we're getting to the point with AI that perhaps um, technology could sense a dramatic change in direction or speed or impact with an object and selectively um, 
you know, there'd have to be some, you know, maybe a minute's worth of data that's archived on every camera. But when the AI senses something going on, it might be able to go back, save that minute in advance of the incident and continue to save it until someone says stop. Um, I think there's a lot we could learn from that, but I know the cost of data storage on that many cameras has got to be prohibitive, but just thinking. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Broom. Is road rage measurable? <laughs> In blood pressure units. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you have an answer for that, Greg? <laughs> I, I I would agree with you that uh, blood pressure gauge, or uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, similar to the um, breathalyzer to for some. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. I have a I have a, qu a clarifying question, Greg, on slide ten. Uh, arterial traffic cameras. I know this is just one of the uh, current infrastructure we have. Uh, can we differentiate? these several, I don't know how many cameras there are there, can we differentiate between the ones that are static versus the ones that can be controlled, pan, tilt, zoom, et cetera? So we do have that inventory as well. So we know which cameras, I can't move that camera, I can only see this scene, but on the other cameras I can turn around, I can zoom in, et cetera. Right, and we, uh, those are called pan, tilt, zoom, yeah. and uh, those are the cameras that I'm listing. Uh, the other cameras I, I would characterize, uh, they, like you're saying, they're static. I characterize as detectors. They're just looking at one place and they're using machine vision to detect something moving through its uh, field of, of vision. So, yeah, those are just the PTZ cameras. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Brave new world coming. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, what's next on our agenda is... Uh, uh, we just have the informational item, uh, 2022 Annual Listing of Obligated Projects, or ALOP. Yeah, Mr. Chair, just, just refer the committee to that document that's in the in the packet. We don't have a presentation today. Right, understood. Is that, uh, it, it seems appropriate that ALOP follows RTOT, and it's all part of our UPWAP. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, administrative items, uh, we have a report from CDOT first. Who is going to do the report from CDOT? I've, I've begged Stewart. to do it. And the reason I've begged to do it is because the most um, impactful thing that will happen at CDOT this, this month is that Rebecca White will be leaving CDOT to do something else. And I, I wanted to acknowledge how much she means to us, something else, to be determined. Yes. To be determined. Um, I, I want to say um, how much I've appreciated her exceptional ability to explain complex and often very technical aspects of transportation policy and projects. Um, I've appreciated her diplomacy and patience with all of us, both here and at, Dr., uh, at CDOT and, and other places that local governments that she's come and spoken to. Um, she's had an unwavering um, promotion of stakeholder inclusion and transparency through all the years that I've known her and um, her dedication to CDOT and Dr. Cog and the state of Colorado um, has been extraordinary, will be missed. So I wanted to start the report with saying how much I appreciate it, and I'm sure all of you do, Rebecca. You know, I, I feel like Rebecca has been a handholder to me for so many years, and even though I've been in this realm for a lot of years, I, I learned so much from Rebecca, and part of that is the diplomacy and patience. <laughs> so I wanted to say that. Um, in addition, yeah. In addition, um, Rebecca this morning sent me the report uh, that I'm to make today, and I'm really going to miss that. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> really going to miss that. Um, I think it's interesting that um, our TC chair, Don Stanton, had the surprising prescience to um, make sure that this time we have a TC meeting tomorrow, that it's going to be virtual and very short. He must have known this, this big storm was coming, and I'm going to talk to him later about how he knew that. 
um, because that's, yeah, tomorrow, uh, tonight, I guess, and tomorrow. Um, and so we'll have a very short meeting. Um, we're going to talk about the grants update. Uh, we had a Central 70 uh, ribbon cutting, um, I think two months ago, maybe late it November. was, late November, uh, that was attended by um, Shailen Batt, uh, who's now the FHWA um, director, um, and many people, um, Rebecca included, who worked tirelessly on the Central 70 piece. And we got to tour the elementary school and um, the um, playground and the fields and all of that remarkable construction that changed, um, you know, council member changed um, that whole piece of of, of Central 70 into something uh, that's an amenity and an improvement of air quality and all those things that came with that. Um, we also um, will be talking about um, a toll equity program and um, another personnel change at CDOT is um, our chief engineer is retiring, Steve Harrelson. Ben was, yeah, Ben was CDOT, Steve Cook's mouth is like, um, he's been with CDOT for a very long time. We we knew this was coming. He told us a while back that he anticipated retiring in January. So big changes at CDOT, lots of work still to do, um, and appreciate that. Uh, anything I missed here, besides, for goodness sakes, if you don't have to drive during this storm, please don't do it, and be safe. Thank you. Other CDOT comments? Commissioner O'Gee. Just want to share that it's, it's such a big loss for, for CEDA and for all of us. Um, so truly appreciate all the work that you've done, Rebecca. I know that you leave very, very big shoes to fill. And so we trust that everything that you've done to support us will continue to pave the way, but it is a significant loss nonetheless. Thank you. If, if this were a Dean Martin roast, you'd have the floor right now. So Rebecca, do you, do, you have, do you have anything? Um, first of all, thank you very much for all your service to by us here at Dr. Cog. I, I'm just embarrassed, but thank you. Um, I, I will miss this group. I'll miss Dr. Cog quite a bit. I've learned a tremendous amount from, from both uh, sitting back there for many a year um, in my time as CDOT and then being able to join the team. Um, I do plan to stay in public service and, and uh, uh, work on the issues that we all share here and make this a better place to live. So, well. Thank you. Pastor. Pylon and on behalf of Dr. Cox staff, just to express our sincere gratitude to Rebecca. We will miss your partnership and your presence um, in our work. Um, personally, I've known Rebecca since I came to Colorado back in 2014 and was fortunate enough for those that don't know to have landed at CDOT uh, initially, um, partly because Rebecca got tapped to move on to working full-time on the Central 70 project, and she, and she and I spent some time in the trenches together on that project. Um, I've learned a lot from Rebecca, and in my role at Dr. Cog, have just really appreciated her presence um, and her partnership uh, between agencies and our important work. So thank you. You'll be missed, um, um, but I know that we'll stay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, next up, we have CDOT, uh, or I'm sorry, we have the RTD report. Uh, CEO Johnson? I'm going to hear the yeah. floor. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Defer to uh, uh, Director. Vince Music, uh, Director of District J. So we've had some changes, too, in, in the last week, actually one week ago, when our board sworn in. Our new members, including Michael Gouverneur, Ian Harwick, and Joanne Rusha, five were returning re-elected. We also had our executive committee. I did not run for re-election again as chair, but instead supported Lynn Geisinger, who was our chair. Our first vice chair is Peggy. Second vice chair is Eric, Eric Davids. <laughs> Secretary uh, Marjorie Sloan and treasurer. But a great executive committee. Board of directors looking forward to work ahead. Uh, last week was kind of interesting too, because our judge just oh, we, we had to wait and twiddle our thumbs for about a half an hour while everybody on staff was uh, frantically trying to fudge at 6 o'clock in the evening. And, and so our staff did a great job. Other than that, we've just, uh, I guess the executive committee has made recent appointments to our, our small committee up and uh, 
That's all I have, uh, CEO Johnson. If Yes, thank you very much, uh, Director Busick, and good afternoon or morning. Goodness gracious, we've been sitting here for a while. So, <laughs> um, um, first and foremost, want to congratulate Rebecca. And while we didn't have an opportunity to work a lot together, uh, being in these virtual formats and so forth, I did appreciate the opportunity to engage when we did. And I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. And if I can be of any assistance in any way, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'd like to once again, and congratulate our returning board members and our newly elected board members um, to the RTD Board of Directors. I look forward to working in continued partnership as they set policy and my team and I uh, basically implement said policy. With that as a backdrop, a couple of things um, that I'd like to make note of since we last met um, in November. Um, RTD is working in tandem with our sub-regional service councils as we work intently as uh, we forge ahead with our call for projects partnership program. Um, we actually are leading the charge in one instance with the sub-region of Boulder in reference to a program they have put forward, which is a shuttle uh, for gun barrel, and we're using that more or less as the uh, pilot as we go uh, into the future with that. Additionally, I want to touch upon the fair study and equity analysis. As you all know, that's something that has been looming. We have done it with great intention, recognizing that we have not had an undertaking of this magnitude when it comes to fair, uh, uh, fair equity uh, in the same manner. And um, we're kicking off more or less the last big phase of this from a community engagement perspective. Uh, there's going to be some robust engagement that will take place um, throughout the region, and that in turn will shore up a uh, recommended fair structure, which we would bring to the RTD board for them to opine on as one of their major roles is to set fair policy. And we would look to have that rounded out by the uh, latter part of the spring and hope to effectuate any uh, fair policy decisions that the board may consider uh, beginning in uh, January of next year. Um, another uh, project I'd like to touch upon is the Northwest Rail Peak Service Feasibility um, study that we have undertaken with our jurisdictional partners in the Northwest region. Um, specifically on January 31st and the immediate day after February 1st, there will two be two meetings being held, uh, public engagement activities, uh, the January 31st meeting being from 5 to 7 p.m. at the Hampton Inn in Boulder, and then on February 1st, the Westminster, Westminster um, a city uh, park and recreation center. And um, I do recognize some of those dates conflict with RTD meetings, but we were working in tandem with the jurisdictions as that worked best for them going forward. So uh, with that, that concludes my report. Um, I will yield the floor to any other RTD representative should they have any information they'd like to share. Thank you very kindly, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Broom. Thank you. Thank you for that report, for both of those actually. Um, next up we have a report from uh, uh, Ed Silverstein at the Regional Air Quality Commission. Oh, thank you very much. And uh, I guess the uh, the penalty for becoming a uh, a called out permanent member of of RTC instead of one of the other members is having to do a report once a month. <laughs> and uh, right, yes. Uh, but uh, thank you. I'll, I'll hope to do this justice. And um, uh, also, I'd like to thank uh, Rebecca from for her service. Uh, she, Re Rebecca serves on the Regional Air Quality Council Board. And um, so we'll have to find a replacement, but uh, which will be hard to do. But uh, we appreciate Rebecca's service to um, people of Colorado and, and her air quality improving efforts and in, in, in her work. And, and I know we'll be in touch as time goes by. And um, as far as uh, air quality matters, uh, just a, a brief overview of, uh, of some recent developments. Uh, in December of, it seems like a long time ago already, um, the, uh, the Air Quality Control Commission um, conducted an extensive public hearing on the latest uh, air quality plans for summertime alone. And um, it was uh, kind of a good news and, and um, not so good news story. Um, uh, most of our, of our planning efforts, um, the Air Quality Control Commission approved. Um, we have a lot of administrative and, uh, and uh, regulatory requirements to achieve and, and 
and the, the long march to improving air quality. And um, so some of our work will was approved and was moved on to the uh, federal EPA for consideration. And uh, part of our plan, um, because of some technical issues and some administrative uh, policy issues, uh, we uh, withdrew some of the uh, uh, some of our plan. Um, we have two ozone standards that are um, that we have to comply with, and lots of administrative and, and policy matters to consider. And so, basically, it, there was a, um, a punt that occurred to um, to this year. So we'll be back at it in developing our long-range plan for summertime ozone and especially looking at the emission control programs that will um, need to go in place to um, continue to make that progress to improve air quality in our summer months. We exceed ozone standards anywhere between 30 and 60 days a year, um, and the standard only allows for three. So um, that's, that tells you the, um, the, the work in front of us, and it's really in front of all of us because every one of us contributes to the problem, and we're all part of that solution as well. So. We'll be um, conducting um, intensive stakeholder engagement processes this year and into next year, I'm sure, to uh, come up with uh, the next round of uh, recommendations for air quality improving strategies, both voluntary and regulatory measures. And so you'll, you'll be, I'm sure, hearing about those. We invite all of you to participate in our, um, in our board meetings and in our, in our committee meetings um, that we will undertake this effort. And it's all on our website at raqc.org. So um, please follow us and, um, and have your, um, your staff, your teams um, participate. Give us input because we need ideas. We need to know what to do and what to recommend as we, uh, you know, continue. I think that's, that's enough. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Mr. Sor? Thank you very much. Uh, seeing none, I have a couple of items here. First of which is if you parked in the building, uh, CAM has the uh, passes to get you out of the gate. And um, the other announcement is to follow on uh, the uh, advice from CDOT. Uh, Dr. Cog will conduct to, uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday's board meeting virtually. We're going to put out the notice. Uh, we need to do a 24-hour notice. So we made the decision uh, today that we would do a virtual meeting tomorrow. So uh, I don't know if the forecast is still for five to 10 inches in the metro area, but let's remember that we have directors who come in from far away, uh, Georgetown and Lyons and Bennett. So we'll be virtual tomorrow night. Thank you for uh, adjusting to that so quickly. Uh, any other members have uh, any items for our information? Seeing none, our next meeting is Valentine's Day. Feel free to bring me candy and flowers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that, we're adjourned. Take care.